Uh, I'm going to now uh, just introduce uh, our guest speaker for tonight, uh, Julie Fitzpatrick. Uh, Julie is a Scientific Director of the Mordon Research Institute, CEO of the Mordon Group. Uh, she holds a Chair in Food Security at the University of Glasgow School of Medical Veterinary and Life Sciences and was appointed Chief Scientific Advisor for Scotland on the 14th of June 2021. A graduate of University of Glasgow, her PhD was in mucosal immunology in the University of Bristol, and she has a master's in epidemiology uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm not going to go through it all, Julie, but I am going to say that she has uh, taken a particular interest in policy-focused research, and fundamentally, uh, you know, that's where uh, science meets uh, those who of us who are producers on the ground, and obviously uh, the consumer as well. So, Julie, can I hand over to you? Well, thank you very much indeed for the very kind introduction and it's a great honour to be invited here to give the George Scott Robertson Memorial Lecture with my title, Livestock Science Matters for One Health. I want to talk about innovations for One Health from a Scottish perspective, so I was delighted that George Scott Robertson actually had very close links with Glasgow. Um, as an agricultural chemist, as we've already heard, um, he had very strong collaborations with John Boyd Orr, who was another uh, chemist and very famous um, name in the University of Glasgow. And in fact, the building in the middle is the Boyd Orr building. Um, it's a chemistry building and it's where I had my chemistry lectures when I was a first year veterinary student. It wasn't my favourite subject, I have to say. And the building has been described as the most ugly building in Glasgow. I'm delighted that's why I put an extra nice building of Glasgow University underneath. So I'm really uh, speaking today, I suppose, with three hats on. One is the Chief Scientific Advisor for Scotland. I'm responsible for trying to bring science evidence and advice into policymakers. I'm involved in policy for scientists within working, who are working within government, and I like to hopefully promote science for society. In my role as scientific director of Moordan, I want to talk a little bit about technologies, starting with some for COVID-19, but some, introducing some livestock stories from the Institute, which I hope demonstrate the point. And as you've already heard, I'm interested in sustainable glo global food security, which really arose from my chair at the University of Glasgow. So when it comes to innovations for SARS coronavirus 2, I mean, this has just been a fantastic example of innovations in action. With vaccines, it's based on new technologies, viral vectored, mRNA, recombinant antigen vaccines. But it was based on knowing about the sequencing of the virus and the variants. And what was really innovative was the products that we had, the vaccines that were so important. When it comes to the diagnostic tests, those were mainly, mainly based on new applications of existing technologies, but again, knowing the sequence of the virus. Those were developed into PCR tests, and what was novel here was the lateral flow tests that we were able to use in our own homes. And of course, the use of surveillance for the virus in our wastewater systems, a fantastic innovation. The third area is disease prevention and reduction interventions. I count these as the data collection, analysis and sharing, the mathematical modelling that was taking place right across the country, innovations in our engineering systems, social sciences and communications. So there the, the innovations are processes and actions, innovations are not just about products, it's how we do things and the actions that result. COVID-19 had a single purpose, it had a huge amount of funding, but my image up at the top right is the triple helix. That's academia, industry, and government working together to solve problems, and I'll return to that later on. So does livestock science matter? Well, I, would imagine, I truly believe it does. I think it really matters to the livestock under our care, farmed and managed animals. It obviously matters to livestock owners and managers, to the public policymakers, politicians, and I also believe that it's, it, it is highly relevant to the environment and indeed the planet, planetary health. 
And of course, scientists, animal, veterinary, and in the One Health area, particularly medical and biomedical colleagues, and social and environmental science. So livestock science matters to policies. The sustainable development goals up on the right there, I've highlighted the ones that I always talk about, which is life on land, uh, climate action, um, responsible um, uh, production and consumption. But it's also relevant to many policies at the UK level. And rather than giving the names of the individual policies, I've just given the titles that I think are relevant to this livestock science agenda. Animal health and welfare, sustainable and safe food production, climate change and biodiversity, reducing our reliance on antimicrobial drugs and chemicals, and human health and well-being. So each country has policies where livestock matter. And to me, these policies together encompass One Health. So my interpretation of One Health is that wider agenda, not just the diseases that pass from animals to humans or vice versa, but the whole policy area of the One Health agenda. Um, Morton Research Institute was started in the 1920s, interestingly, just round about the time of George Scott Robertson. Um, and this particular image down on the left is our mobile laboratory. This picture was from 1924, and the lab moved around uh, Scotland diagnosing disease in our farmed livestock. Mordun was started by Scottish farmers who had, they had sheep that were dying, they didn't know why. So when it comes to livestock in, uh, infectious disease, we've got some fantastic innovations. And the reason Mordun focuses only on infectious disease is it's the diseases that reduce our biological efficiency of our livestock. It creates waste in our primary production systems. It causes poor welfare and food safety and quality. And of course, with some diseases, we have the risk of transmission to humans. We've got multiple pathogens. Those might be endemic or production diseases, emerging, re-emerging, exotic, and zoonotic. But what I really like about working with innovations in this area is I think we can take actions now. So rather like COVID, we can develop vaccines, we can use diagnostic tests, and we can develop disease control programs. So I think these are tangible things that we can actually aim to do and actually roll out into our farming systems, not just in the UK or the EU, but worldwide. I'm going to start with my story, which is a worldwide story, which is our work at Mordun to develop a vaccine for the nematode worm, Haemonchus contortus. This is a nematode worm that affects sheep and goats, and particularly in the southern hemisphere of the world. And the new product here is that we developed a nubble vaccine. The vaccine is a native protein. That means we derive the vaccine from the worm itself. So this is another example that I like to use about science into practice, because we commercialise this vaccine and it's on sale in Australia, and it's called Barbervax. You'll see where I acknowledge the scientists who have done this work in the boxes below. Sorry. So Haemonchus contortus is a, a, a blood-sucking worm. It's called Barber's pole worm, and that, that red um, spiral going down the worm is its gut. It sucks blood. On the right, you can see that it's in the fourth stomach, the abomasum of our small ruminant species, and it damages the surface and releases a whole load of blood, the really voracious blood suckers, and it causes very high mortality very suddenly in lambs in Australia. Um, what makes it even worse is that the worms um, in these areas are resistant to the three main drug groups that we use to treat worms, and the epicentre is in New South Wales in, um, in the east coast of Australia. We make the vaccine in Albany in Western Australia, and I'll say a bit more about that as I go on. In order to understand this story, though, you need to know about the life cycle of Haemonchus contortus. In the centre, you've got the adult worms. They mate inside the abomasum of the sheep and they lay eggs. The eggs pass out in the faeces of the sheep and they go on to pasture. They then de develop into infective larvae onto the grass and those are eaten by the sheep and that completes the direct life cycle. So when we're trying to produce a vaccine, we're trying to get rid of the adult worms because if we kill the adult worms, it stops the egg laying and stops the pasture contamination. 
So what we did was um, develop a, a, a vaccine. This is a cut through of Haemonchus contortus, and the structure in the center is its gut. It's got a huge gut, and it's a very long gut. And so the molecules on the surface of that gut are appropriate targets for vaccines. And below it, you can see the lining of the gut has these microvillus, micro, uh, microvilli on the surface of the gut. We harvest those um, microvilli and we, and we extract the proteins and make the vaccine from that product. So the product's made from the worm itself. When we vaccinate the animals, if you look at the graph on the top right, the blue uh, triangles are first dose of vaccine, second dose of vaccine. The vaccinated sheep mount an antibody response to the vaccine, which is what we want. Unvaccinated sheep, no response. You can see that along the bottom axis. So when we then challenge those sheep, those sheep that have been vaccinated or control sheep, you'll see that the controls start to produce egg counts. So they're not vaccinated, they produce eggs as we would expect. But what was fantastic about this vaccine is when we used the vaccine, the egg counts in the faeces were almost zero, very, very low indeed. So the image in the center is to try and explain what happens. So when you vaccinate the sheep, the sheep mounts an antibody response. The worms are inside the fourth stomach, sucking away at the blood. When they suck the blood, they get the antibody and the antibody sticks to the surface of the worm's guts. That's an immunofluorescence antibody. And when that happens, the worms starve to death and the egg counts drop. So it is a very novel vaccine. What I want to really, the point I really want to make, apart from saying about the innovation and the technology, is how difficult it was to commercialize it. We had to set up our own company called Wormvax UK, which is a subsidiary. We then had to set up Wormvax Australia in Australia, because you have to do that to manufacture and sell a product. We had a good manufacturing product license, awarded in 2010, and the Levy Board Meat and Livestock Australia funded the clinical trials at the cost of um, hundreds of thousands of Australian dollars. It was a substantial investment. And we focused our sales in Armadale in New South Wales, the area I showed you. We launched the vaccine in 2014 and sold out by word of mouth within days. And some of our farmers were vaccinating between 30,000 to 100,000 sheep in their particular farming. It worked fantastically. And the vaccine was called a miracle by some of the farmers who used it, by many farmers, because this worm had stopped the sustainability of sheep farming in some of these areas. They could not control it. And what we're really pleased about is no big pharma company was involved. Because we made the vaccine, we were able to price the vaccine so that it could be used by farmers. We were worried that animal health companies might put it on the shelf because it competes against their worming market. So um, it's doing really well. It's making us quite a lot of money, I have to say, at last. It took a long time. But it's a global impact because our vaccine is also on sale in South Africa. It's called Wirevax. It works in boar goats in South Africa, sheep and goats in Tanzania, Bergamasco used in Brazil. So it has a global impact. And so when I bring you back to the science into the One Health policy and practice, what I'm convinced about is that our vaccine for homonchus does contribute to One Health. It does it through these other policies. It's reducing death and disease in lambs, contributing to animal health and welfare. We can now use pastures which were too dangerous to put sheep on. That helps sustainable food production. The animals produced more greenhouse gas emissions per unit of output. So if we address that, we address the climate change targets and we reduced the use of anthelmintics and the cost of wormers on these farms, reducing anthelmintic use. And I believe that this has underpinned regional food production in a number of countries and continents, particularly in poorer continents of the world, contributing to human health and well-being and our One Health agenda. So the innovation issues is it's a world first. There has been no other vaccine of this type for a gut-dwelling nematode. We had to commercialize it ourselves. The valley of death, that's between research and development and product development, was funded by Australian levy pairs, lamb and beef. It took a very long time, about 20 years for this to happen. And what I'm also interested in is the One Health agenda. 
This particular image is the vaccine antigen. It's very small, it's smaller than a virus. It's a complex molecule, and we couldn't make it by recombinant technologies. That's why we had to harvest it from the worms. But this particular antigen is conserved in worms. Other worms have the same um, molecular complex in their gut, and that includes human hookworm, where we can detect the same molecular structure. So in the day that we can produce recombinant versions of this vaccine, it does have the potential to be a One Health game changer, we hope. My second story is about a diagnostic test for sheep scab uh, caused by the ectoparasite mite Seroptis ovus. And here the innovative product I'm talking about is a commercial diagnostic test. The image on the top is clear that those animals have sheep scab. They're scratching, they're itching, they're in pain and they've lost their fleece. But what about the sheep in the bottom? Have they got disease? Difficult to tell if there are no lesions. So this example is, I, I like to call it science into policy and practice. Sheep scab in Scotland is notifiable. It's a huge welfare problem right across the UK. And we were very fortunate that DEFRA started to fund a sheep scab program run by Moordun. We've just started a new Scottish study in the Outer Hebrides in Lewis and Harris. And it was fantastic that we got BBSRC funding in Northern Ireland to look at sheep scab at management. And I was just really impressed that a basic funder like BBSRC would fund a project of this type because it shows how important it is to get knowledge into practice. So our sheep scab diagnostic test is based on identifying a protein which is produced by the mite itself. It's called PSO02. And it's a homologue. It's very similar to the structure of the human dust mite allergen, which is called DERP2. This is a recombinant protein, an artificially um, constructed protein assay. And we can take blood samples from sheep. And sheep that have got low levels of infection will have antibody, and it can be picked up by our diagnostic test. It's highly sensitive, 98%, so it picks up a lot of our infections, including preclinical and latent infestations where you can't see any signs. And it's highly specific. It doesn't cross-react with other um, ectoparasites or other uh, worms, for example. So we've developed an ELISA test, and we have a lateral flow test, which is under development. We're also working on a vaccine developed from similar recombinant antigens. And I'm not going to talk about that today, but our vaccine trials against sheep scab are actually going very well and may well be complementary to the diagnostic test. This slide is just to cover the management and control of, of sheep scab. Um, Natalie called for flock's sake. I don't know who made up that uh, particular title. But the graph on the right, you can see the hotspots in England. This is the first part of the study the hotspot up in Lewis and Harris. And what happens here is there's regional coordinations of farmer networks, bringing farmers together in clusters of contiguous farms, farms which are in the same region attached to each other. There was a raising awareness of sheep scab and best practice advice, then use of the diagnostic ELISA test to detect early disease or, or even um, full disease, and then to coordinate treatments for sheep scab within clusters, geographical clusters. And the role of the local vets was really crucial to project, to project success and legacy. So you can see down at the bottom, this, there's been over, um, in England uh, so far, there's been over 600 flock tests and 12,000 samples taken. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see that we've just started work in Northern Ireland, chaired by Paul Crawford, involving um, Northern Ireland Sheep Scab Group, AFBE, and Animal Health and Welfare Northern Ireland. The aim was to recruit 100 farms in Northern Ireland, and that has almost been achieved in a very short period of time. So a fantastic sort of GB-wide uh, programme. So you'll be used to this now. This is me trying to explain why I think science into One Health and policy and practice does matter to One Health. So if we can control sheep scab, we improve welfare and reduce pain. And part of One Health is making sure our animals are healthy and happy. We reduce the use of chemical dips and sprays and reduce the disposal of those chemicals. So that helps in our reducing antimicrobial and chemical, um, chemical use. 
Again, we've got our increased efficiency of production. Animals that are in pain don't produce much meat or whatever else they're, they're producing. Um, uh, wool in the case of, of, uh, of some uh, sheep rearing countries. Um, and so that contributes again to climate change and biodiversity. We achieve legislative requirements, which is important for sustainable food production. And I truly believe that this underpins regional food production and associated businesses and communities. I don't think it's acceptable anymore that we have such a pain-inducing disease that is technically controllable and yet we're not able to control it. So this is an example to me that is really important. So my innovation issues here is a big problem for industry. Collaboration is vital, not just farmers, but vets and governments to make sure that these are um, these programs are rolled out and we have technological innovations which exist now to detect and hopefully prevent the disease rather than waiting to treat and again the one health angle on this is that technology is based on comparisons with how dust mite led the identification of the antigen that was used in the diagnostic test so really important with the medical biomedical and veterinary aspects the third big area over and above vaccines and diagnostic tests is disease control programs. And that of course is leading towards net zero and that's a one health goal for all of us. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and from ruminants included. And that's because ruminants produce methane, which has 80 times the warming potential compared to carbon dioxide over about a 12 year period. So it's a relatively short period. So how can disease control help? Well, if we can control particularly endemic, common endemic production diseases, we get faster growth rates, better daily live weight gains, better feed conversion, and reduced involuntary culling. We can cull for production reasons, not for disease reasons, and we can um, reduce reproductive failure, which is extremely important. But if we're really to make an impact, these have to focus on the prevalence of the common diseases. So there are some examples here about gastrointestinal paras parasitism in sheep. Sheep with worms have an, a 10% increase in greenhouse gas emissions compared to those that don't. Cattle with liver fluke take longer to reach time to slaughter. Yoni's disease, 20% extra greenhouse gas emissions per litre of milk and 40% per kilogram of beef. And I would like to particularly acknowledge um, Philip's goose uh, who is Robin Scoos is in the audience, his uh, twin brother, uh, Philip, works with us, and is particularly interested in the greenhouse gas emissions. When I was asked to, to make this presentation, I was asked particularly about the, the Scottish system, how things work on collaboration. And I've just given some examples here on some of the zoonotic infections, some of the diseases that pass from animals to humans. One example being in water safety. So Mordon is involved in studying Cryptosporidia and identifying Cryptosporidia through water testing for the water authorities. The main one in Scotland being Scottish water. But we work with SEPA, the Scottish Environment uh, Protection Agency, and farmers and land managers. So everything I've got in green are, are kind of key partners in this. The map is Glenlivet um, water catchment area. People who were visiting the area were coming down with cryptosporidiosis. If you lived there, you were okay, but if you moved in, then you came down, not always, but there were outbreaks of cryptosporidia. And the beef farmers in the area were blamed for contaminating the water supply. By looking at fecal samples right across the hillside, we identified cryptosporidia parvum, not just in cattle, but in sheep, and in two different deer species. So that actually reduced the tension in this particular area and um, working with the farmers and land manager, we were able to, to reduce the, the level of contamination by keeping the deer off some of the water sources and keeping cattle out of the water sources. For those of you though that are whiskey drinkers, um, Cryptosporidia does not survive in neat whiskey. So um, I think there is probably a, a moral in that particular story. Uh, story. Food safety, um, our sugar toxin producing E. coli, 0157, um, are a problem in our cattle systems and in farmed venison in Scotland. Interestingly, we were called in, in studies to look at wild shot venison 
and the, um, the, serot the, the strains of E. coli that our sugar toxin producing do exist in wild shot venison, but a, at a very low level. So that was very important for the estate managers in Scotland. So again, my green collaborators there are Food Standards Scotland, farmers and estate managers. But E. coli is complex because it moves through soils and environment into vegetables and fruit and through our livestock species a very complex uh, system indeed. Antimicrobial resistance is another area that we work in, looking at um, AMR genes in slurry and different types of uh, fertilizers, including a uh, human uh, fertilizer, uh, looking for AMR genes in wildlife, at uh, seals and geese who are exposed uh, to some of the infectious organisms uh, associated with AMR genes, and the examples here on our collaborators are Nature Scott, Sea Mammal Research Unit, Orkney Goose Management Group, and the Scottish One Health Antimicrobial Group, which is a network of people involved in antimicrobial resistance in Scotland. So again, it shows that lots of different partners are involved in this. And my last example isn't a, isn't, it is a, an infection, but it's, it's an example of comparative medicine. So, you will be aware in Northern Ireland, if you're a farmer or a scientist, that there is a disease called Yaxicti or ovine pulmonary, pulmonary adenomatosis. It's, called, it's caused by a retrovirus, it's a virus infection, and it's very unusual because it induces lung tumours. There's no immune response in the sheep, so it's really difficult to detect. But this is a really good model, we believe, for human bronchoalveolar carcinomas. And we've just had very significant funding from a private international human health company because this is an inducible tumour that we can get the dose, we can put it in the right part of the lungs, and sheep can be a very good model for diseases. They're larger animals, they're bigger than mice, and they're easier to sample. And so they can be actually uh, very good models and more easy to manipulate for comparative medicine studies uh, with human medicine. So my very final uh, slide and final matters for livestock science and One Health innovations is that there is no one size fits all. I would like to say that we had in Scotland a, a collaboration that encompassed everything in One Health. We don't. And my last slide is to try and show that, that it's groups of people for individual areas that are coming together, but it does need collaboration. I do f tr truly believe that research and development in the One Health area and in livestock science needs medium to long-term funding. We need different funding options for research and development at different levels of technology readiness. So there's lots of spectra, there's things that need very basic science, there's things that are somewhere in the middle about strategic, and then there's the translational aspect. So we need to keep attracting funding for that. And we've got fantastic technological advances in bioscience and computing science and that will make great strides in the pipeline from R&D through to our products. The biological question, however, remains vital. We've got all these technologies, but what is the question we're trying to ask and how do we go about it? I mentioned at the beginning about the triple helix, academia, industry and government. And how do we get that to work, not just in a pandemic situation, but in these endemic situations, in these constant threats that we have from zoonotic and endemic diseases. And I think one of the problems is that funding for One Health projects is not easy. And that's due to lack of clarity on he who benefits pays. So my previous slide with the diseases of animals, the problem there is the animals are quite healthy in the majority, there's a few exceptions, but many zoonotic diseases, the animals are healthy, but they are producing organisms that are dangerous to humans. And so it's very difficult to identify a market for some of the R&D that's required to produce products that will help in that situation. I definitely believe that scientific collaboration is key and that workshops and conferences help. There's something about getting together and talking about these things. Um, I chaired a meeting um, which was called a One Health meeting. It was due to be in Edinburgh, but it was a remote meeting. And the session that I chaired had a number of speakers and three of the groups who were speaking, as a result of that conference, we got together, more than Italians and an English organization, one conference, one workshop at that conference, and we got a big EU grant from that 
um, interaction. It was actually on a one health disease called Coxiella burnetti, which is called <coughs> Q fever. But that to me really showed that it does matter about linking up together. And even with a virtual conference, we got a big EU grant out of that, which was great. The grand challenges that I think um, that we've already heard about from David, they are, those are grand challenges. And I think from science, those need to be big teams. And um, I also wanted to say wicked problems need interdisciplinary approach. I hated the word wicked and I didn't like it when I heard other people use it, but then I looked up the definition and it's, it's described as difficult or impossible to solve because of complex and interconnected nature. And then I thought I would use the word wicked here because I think some of the things that we're talking about are truly wicked problems. So how do we you know, do it together? It is about collaboration. And then my, my really final word is that I do believe that knowledge exchange is the springboard for the appliance of science. There's no point having science and technology if you can't get it out into the communities, into the vets, into the farmers, not just here, but right across the world. We can export our technologies and our science and really make a difference. And you will have remembered that I showed you our mobile laboratory at the beginning of the presentation from 1924. Um, this was our centenary mobile bus and um, we reached 100 years in 2020, 2020, yes that's right, so we started in 1920, 2020 uh, we celebrated our centenary and we redesigned a new mobile laboratory which is now travelling around Scotland doing exactly the same job with different technologies as was done 100 years ago. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I do hope you agree with me that livestock science does matter for One Health. Thank you.